Okay, before I get into the story, there's a few things I need to explain about my country, South Africa, for you to fully understand the story. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, and alarms. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time, we had six dogs, two Sharpays, two German short-haired pointers, and two Dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day, so they can do their thing. Another thing about South Africa. It's normal to have a live-in domestic worker and gardener. The average family usually employs them. It's not only for wealthy people. For the story, our domestic worker is Ellie, and our gardener is Vince. So this happened back in 2007, when I was 9 years old. My brother who was 10, and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad decided to surprise us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies, or to communicate with our parents. Anyways, it's an important piece of info for the story. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night, but I remember it being a hot summer night that night. So of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open, and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room, setting up our new cell phones, all excited. Ellie's daughter, Anne, who's like an older sister to us, was 18. She was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house, and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs would not shut up, and how annoying it was. That's when I noticed it too. Sure, they'd bark, but it was usually the dachshunds that yapped, when the bigger dogs just chilled. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes, then they'd get over it. Something was different that night, as even the bigger dogs were barking non-stop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dog's incessant barking, and he was going to go check to see if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head, and I don't believe my dad thought that anything was amiss either, because my brother asked to investigate with him, and my dad agreed. I was obviously too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow when my dad had noticed that all the dogs were grouped up, growling and going nuts at a dark corner behind our swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is our garden beyond our pool hits a slight decline, so we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights up, but my dad had noticed how the lamp seemed to be off which confused him, because he could have sworn it worked the other night. Either way, my dad said he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of this, and because of how out of character the dogs were acting. He called after them, which they'd usually come running, but tonight, they all seemed just to look at him, then turn back around and continue going crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a torch. When my brother went back inside, my dad slowly approached the steps. He noticed how the dog seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out of his view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched closer to the steps as he put two and two together. It was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and an avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four men, all in balaclavas, all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was. That he saw my dad come out with my brother, but my brother went back into the house. Why? My dad said something came over him, and before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, He's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all of these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu, assuming my dad couldn't understand. It's not common for white people to speak, but 
My dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said in Zulu, Shit, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill him, grab what we can, and go. The other seemed apprehensive, and a smaller guy seemed really on edge, who then continued to say that he can't go back to jail again, and that they needed to get out before the cops show, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking in English, pretending not to understand what they were saying said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drove in our area and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago they'll probably be here any second and that did it my dad watched as the plan unraveled before them this smaller scared guy freaking out all the other guys saying that they needed to leave asap or else they'd be caught he seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full-on bickering amongst themselves their plan slowly turning to shit. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto his crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly turn back up the steps and then turn and dart toward the house. As luck would have it, as my dad ran into the veranda door, my oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arm mid-run, and sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, I know, but I think he just wanted to get my brother inside as quickly as possible, without even thinking. Anne and I were obviously oblivious to everything when my dad rushed through the bedroom door, slamming it shut and telling us to go up to the attic. There's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs, now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding, and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind me. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel not too far behind. We sat there in darkness in silence. I swear, you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just waiting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed, saying she didn't have a phone. Neither did my dad. But ha, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it than now, right? My mom dials the police, and I kid you not, they asked where we lived. We explained, and then they told us that it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry. Click. The line goes dead. We're now not only shitting ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realizes, damn, he didn't close the veranda door. And what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm from the safe in the attic and tells us that whatever we hear, to not come downstairs, to stay hidden no matter what. Now I'm sobbing, begging my dad not to leave us, but he tells us he has to go get Ellie and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there's even more tears, as reality hits that there's two other people still in danger. Anne is understandably in hysterics, because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears, and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, which is the armed security that drives around the area, and they said they'd be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They say to wait and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or anything indicating these men are in our house. But there was just silence. The only sound was the dog's barks outside. After what seemed like hours, which was most likely a couple of minutes, we heard stomping coming up the stairs and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and praying that it was my dad, with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while. No one dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably, but they were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang, and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was the security company. And sure enough, it was. He opened up, and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees buckling 
from the adrenaline my body endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police, and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there were actually seven pairs of footprints, and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and climbed over it. We had an electric fence put in shortly after, so there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. South Africa's violent crime is quite bad, and it's sickeningly common for torture to happen during home invasions. I was obviously so young at the time, I didn't know the horrors of the world, and was just scared of my family getting hurt. Now that I'm older, just the thought of four women being in the house, and my mom being in nothing but a bath towel, gives me chills to this day. The cops said the fact that there were so many guys, instead of like one to three, indicates that these guys possibly had sinister intentions. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family, and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and could manipulate the situation to benefit us. Lastly, my family will forever be in debt to our good boys and girls that warned us that night. A terrifying and life-changing outcome would have 100% happened that night had it not been for our incredible doggos. From that day onwards, my dad always gave them leftover rice or meat with their dinner. Rest in peace, Impy, Shudo, Dash, Fudge, Wrinkles, and Pikachu. I'm sure there was a special place in heaven reserved for you angels. This happened to me a couple of years ago now, but when it first happened, given how crazy it was, it took me a few weeks to collect myself enough to type it up and post it. It's relevant for me to tell you up front that I'm a military veteran and I have PTSD and anxiety, as well as a pretty bad case of depression that I'm currently in my third year of. I've read that cognitive behavioral therapy can massively improve PTSD symptoms and in turn help to reduce my anxiety, so I have been trying various techniques at home. The problem is, my wife and I live in a small two-bedroom, ground-floor flat, with an upstairs neighbor with absolutely no concept of other people. A jock douchebag type, who's a personal trainer, but he trains at home too, cause gains. The kind of guy whose only two topics of conversation are protein powder and steamed rice. I'm sure you can imagine the type. Anyway, with that being a constant issue, medication and quiet mindfulness are just not possible with the constant noise. My solution to this was to do my normal routine during the day, but take advantage of my insomnia later on. At around 11pm, I would put on my coat and shoes. As we live near the beach, I figured I could walk to the beach, now that there's pretty much no one around, walk on the sand, and be mindful to the sounds of the ocean. Sounds nice, doesn't it? It was the first two times, but you know what they say, the third time's the charm. The walk to the beach from my home isn't that far, maybe a little over half a mile, but once I got there, I would walk to the very end of the beach, until you reached the cliffs, where there was a World War II artillery gun turret, which was another half mile. Sometimes I would walk the path up the cliff, to the gun, and just stare out into the blackness of the midnight ocean which was only broken by the occasional flash of light from the lighthouse. I would sit and listen to the waves crashing against the cliffs. Sometimes I would close my eyes and just concentrate on nothing but that sound. I felt safe there, knowing I was alone. Just me and the ocean. Usually, before I turned tail and head home, I would walk down to a small row of benches, they're all marked with plaques in remembrance of someone who also came and enjoyed the view, although I imagine they came during the day. The benches are close to an old pub that was shut down years ago, and I heard that the place used to get used as a dogging site or a brothel or something back in the day. So when I saw a vehicle with headlights coming towards the pub, I figured it was some young lads trying to catch potential doggers at it. I sat on the bench and waited for the car to pass me 
but as it rounded a bend in the road further up, I was momentarily lit up by the headlamps. The headlights of the vehicle went off immediately, and the car went off-road and out of sight for a moment. At this point I was fully alert, and a bit cautious, so I dropped to one knee and ducked behind the bench I had been sitting on. They drove past me, it was maybe only 40 feet from me. As the lighthouse still illuminated the vehicle, I could now see it was an old beat-up Land Rover kind of vehicle, with shitty camo paint on the wings. At that moment, someone popped out of the top of the vehicle, with a scoped rifle and a big torch. In that instant, in my head, I was back in Iraq, and my senses felt razor sharp. I dropped on my belt buckle and crawled into a patch of long grass, adjacent to the benches. Then I got in a position where I could see them, but they couldn't see me. The guy with the rifle shone his torch at the exact bench I'd been sitting on, then the others. Searching for me, he started looking all around him, through the scope. Looking for where I might have gone. My heart was pounding so hard, it felt as if I could hear it. I held my sleeve over my mouth to muffle the sound of my breathing, but more importantly, trying to hide the condensation of my breath. The vehicle started to move to get a better view of the benches, so I started slowly crawling towards the main road, as not only is there a row of houses, but an old stone bus stop that I could take hard cover in if they saw me and open fire. After about five minutes of hiding in the long grass, it started to rain, and they were clearly still looking for me. The guy with the rifle was scanning around with his eye down the scope, so I waited till he was looking away from me to seize my moment to run for cover. I pushed my hand hard onto the wet dirt to launch myself onto my feet, then I sprinted towards the bus stop while throwing some zigzags in there just in case they had seen me. Luckily they didn't, and I was now far enough away that I could take out my phone and call the police. They were there with a riot van and squad car in about 10 minutes, and as I was talking to the officers in the van, they spotted the gunner's vehicle and took off after them. The officers in the squad car stayed behind to talk to me. The rain was coming down in sheets by now. They asked me if I was absolutely sure it was a rifle, and I told them yes, 100% it was. No doubt in my mind at all. The officers both looked at each other, and then one of them asked, and what exactly is your experience with firearms? I told them I was ex-army, and I've seen my fair share of all kinds of firearms. They then asked me what I was doing there after midnight, which is a pretty fair question to be honest. I explained that quite ironically, I was taking a mindfulness walk to ease my PTSD symptoms. They were satisfied with that explanation, if not somewhat amused, and told me that the firearms response unit was en route. I asked if they needed me to stay behind and make a statement, but the officers told me not to bother waiting around because they most likely wouldn't need to take a statement beyond the call I made. And also, it was pissing it down with rain, so I should go home and get dry. It was over, but I still felt super weird, and my heart was still thumping hard in my chest. I started the walk home, and when I was about halfway there, a police helicopter buzzed overhead and settled over the area where I had been sitting on the benches, with the searchlight going. It was right then, it hit me like a shotgun to the chest. That happened, that was real, and it was here. My head started swimming, my heart was pounding twice as hard now and my legs felt like jelly. My lungs felt glitchy, and I couldn't breathe properly. I dropped to my knees, crying in the street in the pouring rain. The only light coming from a nearby street light with a flickering bulb. I was gasping for breath, thoughts flashing in my head, thinking that if I had stayed, if I hadn't hunched behind the bench, if I had done any number of things differently or hadn't, then I could have gurgled my last breath alone, in the dark, in the cold wet dirt, and my wife would be none the wiser, till the following day. I have no idea if they were there for me, and if they were, how could they have known I'd be there? It had been twice before, I suppose. It's not like there's animals to hunt there, beyond foxes. But why hunt foxes from a vehicle, with a rifle and a torch at midnight? Anyway, I'm not ashamed to say that that experience terrified me. I guess my army training helped me stay alert and to stay hidden, but I don't really know. 
I don't go walking at night anymore, and I have the occasional nightmare about the whole thing. This is the story of the co-worker I had a long time ago, so I can look back on it now and laugh. But at the time, it was really distressing for me. To give some context, every summer I would do some temp work for the company where my dad worked. It was an education company, so they always needed temp workers around in July to August time for all the exam remarks that they had come in. It was data entry work, but it suited me fine and it meant I could earn a little extra cash while I was at university. I did this every summer from when I was about 19 right through to when I was 23. And then I got another job at the same company for a bit after I graduated. But we'll get to that later. For now, all you need to know is that I was a reasonably familiar face there and everyone knew I was my dad's daughter. The main downside of working there was that I'd clock off at 5 p.m., but I'd have to wait for my dad to finish work since he was the head of an entire department. So he'd end up staying a bit later. Every day I'd bring a book with me and sit in this little foyer area between his department and the department where I worked since it had the most comfortable chairs. I must have been 22 years old when this happened because it was the penultimate summer that I worked there. I just had my hair cut short for the first time in my life and I'd also dyed it red as well. I was sitting on these couches, reading, when all of a sudden this guy approaches me. We'll call him Leon. He tells me that he works in my dad's department, and he thought he'd come introduce himself. This was a pretty common occurrence for me, and I was aware of this guy. He was young and decent looking, so a few of the women in my department had a crush on him. I was dating someone at the time though, and I had never actually seen him in person, but I could see what they saw in him. We got to chatting, and he mentioned that I changed my hair, so I told him about cutting it short, and he cut me off mid-sentence. This is where it started to get weird. He said, no, first it was brown, and you didn't have the fringe, then you went through the phase of curling it, then you put the fringe in, and dyed it red. After that, you dyed it purple, now you've had it cut short, and dyed it back to red. This guy that I had just met was describing over two years worth of hairstyle changes that I'd had. I felt creeped out, but he seemed like a nice enough guy, and I guess I had worked at the company throughout that entire time, so it was reasonable to assume that he'd noticed me before. That should have been the first red flag. He asked me if I had Facebook, and I told him that I did, so he said he would add me. That seemed pretty normal, but then... After he'd sent me the friend request, he asked me to get my phone out so he could watch me accept it. I'm British, and it's therefore impossible for me to be impolite, so I got my phone out and showed him that I had accepted it. I thought that might calm him down a bit. Bear in mind, he wasn't a bad-looking guy, so I felt a bit flattered at this point that he was so keen on me. That sense of flattery dissolved real fast. After the Facebook thing, he kept asking me if I had MSN, and I told him that I didn't. I swear, throughout this conversation, he asked me if I had MSN about four times. Then the final time he asked, he was like, please can you get MSN so we can chat after work? It was like he had something really urgent he wanted to tell me, but I had only just met this person. I kind of laughed and said about how I hadn't used MSN since I was a teenager without necessarily rejecting him. Then he said something like, well, if you don't have MSN, then do you have Skype? This seemed like the perfect opportunity to bring up my boyfriend, who was a foreign student and went back to his home country during the summer. He was the only person I spoke to on Skype. I said to Leon about how I didn't have my own Skype account, but I used my dad's Skype account to talk to my boyfriend. I really thought this might ward him off. I was wrong. Without missing a beat, he said, Can you please just get your own Skype account so we can chat after work? He said it like I was somehow inconveniencing him, like this was something we'd agreed to do months ago. I had no idea how to react, so I just kind of smiled and laughed. 
Thank the heavens, someone from my dad's department walked past at that moment and was like, Leon, aren't you meant to be at your desk? He scurried off pretty quick after that, but not before reminding me to get my own Skype account and send him the details. I told my dad about the whole exchange in the car ride home, but all he said was that Leon was very friendly and that a lot of women in his department liked him, so maybe I just misunderstood the situation. I thought he was probably right, so I tried not to let it bother me. Later that evening, however, I was on my computer doing university work when a message popped up on my Facebook. It was Leon. All the message said was, we like the same movies. I don't know what it was, but something about this message freaked me out so much. I decided not to respond and logged off Facebook, hoping that he wouldn't notice I had been online. The next day after work, I was sat in my usual spot when Leon comes over to me. His face was like thunder. At first, I thought he was just having a bad day and was walking through the hallway, but my heart dropped when I realized he was walking directly towards me. Why didn't you respond to my Facebook message? I was stunned. How was I supposed to respond to that? Who says stuff like that in real life? Lucky for me, I didn't have an opportunity to respond because he started off on this triad. I'm not even kidding. He started listing all the movies we had in common that he had seen on my Facebook profile. Batman The Dark Knight, Watchmen, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, Fight Club. I just sat there watching him reel off all these film titles. Once he was finished, all he said was, It's okay, I forgive you. And then walked back off to his department. Over the next couple of weeks, he came and found me in my spot every day and talked at me from the moment I sat down to the moment my dad came to get me. I don't remember many of the other exchanges, but I do remember distinctly one day pretending to pick my nose when I saw him coming to see if that would put him off. It did not. It got to the point where I'd get so stressed out after work that I'd go hide in the toilets for as long as I could but the women I worked with started to notice and think I was weird. Eventually, I broached the subject with my dad and he gave me his car keys after my shift so that I could go hide out in his car instead of the building. So I'm camped out in his car and I'm still feeling quite tense. But after about 20 minutes, I start to feel at ease. Surely he won't come looking for me out here. Wrong. I look over at the main entrance and my heart drops. He's coming out of the door, and he's scrutinizing all the cars. I sank down as far as possible into my seat, but I wasn't fast enough, and he saw me. He comes rushing over, and starts tapping on the glass. So I open the door and ask him what's up. I didn't see you in your usual spot, but luckily the doorman told me he saw you come out here. Why are you in your dad's car? Again, what are you supposed to say to that? I told him I had a headache, so I'd come out to the car to take some paracetamol and see if I could get some sleep. At least he respected that, because he told me to feel better and then left me alone. I breathed a sigh of relief, knowing that I was only going to be working there for a few more days before I had to go back to university. I told my dad about the car incident, and he gave Leon a talking to the next day. Leon would still come find me in the foyer but he'd only talked to me for a few minutes in passing before leaving me alone. It was a big relief. On my last day at work there, I was fully expecting him to do something crazy, but he didn't even come chat to me that day. I left the office and thought I would never see him again. And I found out he was fired not long after I left the company that year because he kept coming into work late and then spent most of his time at work chatting with his co-workers. Fast forward to January of 2014, and I was preparing to move to China for a position teaching English. I had graduated from university, and I was working at the same company, but this time in a semi-permanent capacity. It was my last day of work, so I'd received quite a few gifts and some fuss from my co-workers. It was about 10 a.m. when who should I see walk through the door but Leon. He had been hired as a temp to do the job I had done for so many years. As he walked through the door, he saw me, and this flash of recognition crossed his face. I wanted to slide under my desk and die. 
He came walking over to me and was all smiles, asking about how I was and what I was still doing at the company. It was at this point that one of my co-workers mentioned about how I was off to China soon. Leon seized on that and started talking about his friend who was also interested in teaching English as a foreign language. His interest seemed genuine, so I got to talking about how I got my TEFL qualification, who I got it through, what company I was going to be working for out in China, etc. We chatted for about 20 minutes and he wrote down some details for his friend then went off to work. At the end of the day, I was packing all my stuff to leave and a few of my co-workers were coming over to say their goodbyes. Don't get me wrong, the Leon incident aside, I had a wonderful time working at the company and I made a lot of great friends. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Leon approaching. But I think to myself, what's the harm? He says goodbye and wishes me luck on my new adventure. Then, as I'm literally walking out the door of the department, I hear him call out, See you in China. For the first two weeks of my teacher training over there, I was like a hawk, keeping a constant lookout for this guy. He never did follow me to China, but it still remains as one of the creepiest encounters of my life. This is truly the scariest, most horrible thing that has ever happened to me. I have never been so petrified in my life. To this day, I still don't know who this man was, what he was trying to do, or if he still is where I saw him. I was back home for the summer for the first time in a year after starting university. Our home was, and still is, just outside of a small town with forests all around. There was also a small man-made lake which was diverged from a river that ran for miles through the forest and ramified into a few streams east of the lake. Near my home, there was a small grassy path that led to the river following a stream. It was a long walk but one I used to go on often as a child. I knew the forests there well. I knew where I could cut through dense trees to meet the stream. The walk I would go on always led me off the path which turned northwest slowly, so away from the stream, and then took a sharp turn west after a few miles walk. At which point, the stream was hidden quite deep into the forest. I had continued to walk north and follow the stream through the forest to get to the river, then follow the river west to get to the lake. It's easy to get lost in this forest because the terrain isn't just a slope down to the water, it goes up and down and you end up completely surrounded by trees. I'd spent my days wandering around there alone or with my dad over the span of 18 years. I never saw anybody else in the forest. I went there twice that summer, both times alone. The first time I left in the morning, I walked along the path away from the stream to the sharp end, then cut back into the forest. I reached the stream after an hour or so, as I was running my hands in the water, I heard a bell from far away, coming from the north. Something was making a bell ring fervently and periodically, which I found strange. I listened well, wondered if it was a lost hunting dog, and I started moving towards the sound. I realized it couldn't have been an animal. I could tell the bell was too heavy to be on a collar because of how clear the sound was. I kept moving and the bell was moving away from me. It stopped completely after five minutes. The stream wasn't big enough or strong enough to carry a bell, and the river was far too still. I thought of everything, but nothing explained the sound, apart from one obvious thing, which I just didn't feel comfortable with for some reason. I knew it had to have been a person. I stopped thinking about it and just walked on normally, until I found a badger, a dead one, carefully decapitated. It had obviously been done with a knife. It was fairly fresh. The body was still limp and there wasn't too much smell coming from it. The wound is full of maggots, but I knew that happened soon after exposure. The sound of the bell had been following the stream. So had I. 
So, the badger was put there, maybe killed there, while I was walking that way. Nothing else happened that day. One week later, I went back for the second time that summer, and the last time ever. I left home around 6pm. I made it to the stream, then walked to the river in an hour, then decided to go back the way I came, because it was getting late and it was raining quite heavily. The sun set at around 9pm. I was walking as fast as I could. The sound of the rain in the trees was surreal and loud. I was somewhat trotting with my head down for a while through the clearest and most open part of the forest when I bumped into something heavy. The smell was sickly. It was the decomposing body of the badger, with its head strung to his front paws. That area looked a bit like ham, because of the way it was tied, just swinging from a tree. It was this putrid bag of stench, wet and dripping green liquid. I started gagging. I had some sort of mucus textured fluid in my hair. It was repulsive. At first, I just stared at it, slightly gobsmacked. Then I started fidgeting violently because I felt like I was drenched in its juices. I was soaking from the rain. My sense became confused. It felt like a bucket of ice cold water had been thrown over me. When I realized that I walked the same way to get to the river, so someone had strung up the body after I'd passed it on the way there. Someone knew I'd see it. So, was someone watching me, running around the forest? Were the faint sounds of branches breaking around me, not animals? I looked around and started jogging. I was half running and half walking away from the stream, back toward the path for a while, when I heard the bell again. I proceeded to call my dad while running. I told him to meet me on the path, where it sharply turns west. It was the closest part of the path to me, to go as fast as he could, and that someone was in the forest. I can't explain the feeling I had. It was like I just shit out my intestines and stomach. I literally felt the hairs on my neck raise, despite being so. It was dark. I jogged as fast as I could. I was panicking, because the path was still a bit far away, just too far to feel safe. It was still raining. Every single sound was muffled. I felt like everything was further away than before. The bell went on for way longer than the last time, on and off. I felt like it was surrounding me at one point. The fear, combined with my compromised hearing, and the fact that I couldn't breathe properly, was making me slightly lose my sense of direction. I was automatically heading southwest, but I wasn't really sure what I was even doing. I was breathing like a horse, coughing my lungs up kind of crying out loud, like a toddler does, tripping over leaves and twigs like an idiot. I stayed on the phone with my mom, who was on her way with my dad. I kept hearing sounds, but I wasn't sure what they were. My mom was screaming on the phone at the same time that they were on the path, that I needed to run, that my dad had gotten out and was heading east from the path bend. I was terrified, so I went into survival mode. I was doing the half running, half speed walking thing again because I was out of breath. Then I heard branches break, clear footsteps for the first time from down in the forest and the bell ringing louder. I didn't want to, but I looked over my shoulder. That's when I saw what was in the forest with me, a tall figure creeping in my direction at the very end of the clearing, ringing the bell slowly in front of his stomach. I could tell he was staring straight at me. Now I don't know if I'd had a hidden secret sprinting ability, instinctual adrenaline induced superhuman powers, but when I tell you I ran for my life, I didn't look back once. I screamed as much as I could. I lied. I'm on the phone with the police. They are on the path, I screamed. Dad, I can see you. I'm here. I wanted to yell, Dad, please, where are you? but I kept that to myself. I felt like something awful was going to happen. I felt like this man was right behind me. I kept telling myself not to look back. I was gasping and wheezing, crying so hard and screaming for my dad. I felt shivers on my neck and then switched off. I just ran. 
and I even dropped my bag. I felt like my phone was my only way home. Things no longer felt real. It was like my legs were moving by themselves. I didn't know if the man was still following me. I could only hear my heart beating in my ears and the bell. I finally heard my dad shout my name and I knew he was coming my way and that he could see me because of the intonation of his voice. I pretty much lunged myself at him when we got to each other. My dad heard the bell too. My mom could hear it on the phone. She was waiting with the car to leave fast. We went directly to the police station and I got medical attention soon after. My dad burst into tears in the car, said he could hear the bell and thought that he wouldn't be able to see me. He asked what if I didn't have my phone. What if he hadn't picked up? They were almost as terrified as me because they witnessed everything through the call. They could hear me trying to run and they could hear the danger. They just couldn't see it. The police really couldn't do much. They searched the area and the only thing they found was a folded t-shirt placed under a rock and my bag was not recovered. They said it was probably some homeless man living in the forest but failed to realize what could have happened if my dad didn't know that part of the forest like I did and where to find me. I'm not blaming anyone. The entire thing was my fault. There are just so many what ifs. I want to believe it was just someone who decided to live in the woods and hunt or something. Maybe they were a bit mentally unstable and they felt angry that I came into their territory. But what if it was something more insidious? The way he moved towards me was abnormal. It was perverse because of how slowly he was ringing the bell. It's like he had me trapped. I didn't see any more detail and I just ran. To this day, I can't go anywhere where I'll be alone and the sound of bells is a real problem. The smell of moss as well. Anyway, my parents and Steve Jobs saved my life. So go hug yours now and take decapitated badgers and bells as pagan signs that you're unwelcome. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. As usual, don't forget to leave a like and comment. Let me know what you thought of the stories. Subscribe if you haven't yet. And of course, turn on notifications so you can keep up to date with my latest videos. I would also like to thank my patrons on Patreon. James Gargano, Syntax Flux, Gemma Alam, Elena Renee, Monica Levelais, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Thank you for supporting me and helping me do what I do. If anyone else wants to check out the perks of my Patreon, the link's in the description. Thanks for listening, and I hope you all had a good weekend. I'll see you in the next one.